Hello, friend. If you are watching this video, then I believe that there is something that God wants you to know. You might ask, who is God? You might ask, which God? Simply put, I am talking about the God of the Bible. He is the one who created everything. The stars and planets, the land and the sea and the air, all the animals, and you and me. He is not a God of one element. He is the God of all the elements. He is not a tree, a rock, or an animal. The Bible says that God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You see, God, as the creator of all things, is the supreme being, and he cannot be contained by our small imaginations or anything physical. He is eternal. This means that he has no beginning or end. He is completely self-existing. But most of all, God is holy. Holy means sacred in the sense of something pure, absolutely pure, blameless, without defect. In other words, God is completely and utterly perfect. To be without defect means that God is without sin. He has nothing to do with sin and will not even allow sin in his presence. In this way, God is pure. And here is our problem. While God is pure, we are not pure. The Bible tells us that we are sinners. It says in Romans chapter 3 and verse 10 that there is none righteous, no, not one. We are told again in verse 12 of that same chapter, there is none that doeth good, no, not one. To sin literally means to miss the mark. In this case, it means that we miss the mark of God's holiness. While God is pure, we are not. Furthermore, we never can be. That is why the Bible says that there is none that doeth good. Even the very best we can do is tainted by our sinful nature, as the Bible says in Isaiah 64 in verse 6. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. You see, the world tells us that we can look to our heart to see if we are a good person. But the Bible tells us that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. That's in Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9. Left to ourselves, we are nothing but poor, lost, wicked sinners. When we consider these two facts, that God is holy and we are sinners, we run into a problem. We too are spiritual beings, and that means that we will go on even when our physical bodies die. But we will not simply float around as energy or ghosts, as some suppose. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. You see, God's holiness means that he must exact justice. If God was not absolutely just, if he just let sin slide, he would no longer be holy. Evil must be punished. And God has promised that he will do it. And I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Isaiah chapter 13, verse 11. As I said earlier, we are spiritual beings who will continue to exist when, after our physical death. But because we are sinners, God must execute judgment upon us. We cannot be with him in his holiness. So therefore, we must go someplace else. That someplace else is a place that the Bible calls hell. Three times in the book of Mark, chapter 9, verses 43 through 48, Jesus describes hell. He says that hell is a place where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Hell is also described as a place of darkness, where there is weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. So, there's nothing good about us. Furthermore, there's nothing that we can do, not one good thing, that will alter this in any way. It seems that we are all lost. We are all without hope. But there is another factor at play. 
See, not only is God holy and just, but the Bible tells us that God is loving. More than that, he himself is the ultimate definition of love. 1 John 4, 8 says very directly that God is love. So what does that mean for us? Well, it means that God wants to save us. The Bible says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was crucified on the cross, died, and was buried. But we need to back up. Not only is Jesus Christ the Son of God, he also is God. That may seem hard to understand, but Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 30, I and my Father are one. There are other passages in which Jesus claims to be God, but we will move on for now. Jesus Christ was God in human flesh. He was born of a virgin. This is important because the Bible teaches us that sin is passed down through the Father. Because Jesus had no earthly father, he is without sin. That's important too because Jesus had to be sinless for several reasons. As far as we're concerned for the moment, it was because he was going to do something for us that we could not do for ourselves. You see, Jesus was going to take our punishment on himself. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death, Romans chapter 6, verse 23. We are also told in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Because of our sin, we must die and we must face God's judgment. But when Jesus shed his blood and died on the cross, he did two very important things. First of all, he completely satisfied God's justice. What does it mean that God's justice is completely satisfied? It means simply paid in full. Have you ever paid off a credit card or other outstanding debt? Then you understand what paid in full means. It means that the bill is no longer due. It means satisfaction is complete. The Bible calls this propitiation. Second, he fully justified man. Jesus' bloody death on the cross was a sufficient payment. That means God will never look for any future payment of our sin penalty. Jesus' death was satisfactory in and of itself. Furthermore, Jesus did this for the whole world, as we saw in John 3.16. The Bible says in Romans 3.26 that Jesus is our justifier. Everyone who has ever lived, is living, or whoever lives in the future has had their sins fully paid for once and for all. Not only did Jesus die for our sins, he also rose again. And we are told in Romans 4.25 that he was raised again for our justification. See, you need to understand that a dead Savior is no Savior at all, but a living Savior is another matter altogether. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 16 through 22, For if the dead rise not, then, it is, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead, and become the firstfruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So we see that Jesus' resurrection gives us hope for our eternal future. With all that in mind, what is there left for you to do? First, you must repent of your sin and dead works. Acts chapter 17 verse 30 tells us that God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. And Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1 clarifies that we are specifically to repent of sin and dead works. To repent is simply to have a change of mind that results in a change of heart and action. Concerning sin, it means that you agree with God that your sin and dead works are wicked and that you are willing to walk away from it all. 
literally turning your back on them and turning to and going toward God. Sin, as we have already discussed, means missing the mark. It means our unholiness. So then what about dead works? Dead works are any attempt to earn God's favor in order to obtain salvation. People often do dead works through religion or civic service. Prayer, going to church, reading your Bible, serving your country, feeding the poor, being kind to others. Those are all good things, but they cannot save you. And you must repent of your thoughts that they could ever, ever do so. Second, you must believe. Friend, let me be very clear. Repent does not merely mean lip service. You cannot just say that you believe. You must actually believe. True salvation is not only a matter of the mind, but of the heart. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 9, we are told that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That is what the Bible means when it says that we are justified by faith in Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. That faith is wholly and completely trusting in what Jesus has already done for you. Next, you must confess. Hand in hand with belief is confession. Again, in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9, we read that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. To confess here is not only to confess your sin to Christ, but it is to confess your allegiance to Christ. That is, you are openly, publicly acknowledging that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh and that he reigns supreme over all matters of life and death. Next, you must call on the Lord. Romans chapter 10 and verse 13 tells us, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This may seem obvious, but if you believe what the Bible says, if you believe that Jesus is real, you will call on him to save you. Next, you must receive him. John chapter 1 verses 11 through 12 says, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. You need to understand that God will never force himself on you. Real love can never be forced. It must always be a choice, and God leaves that choice up to you. You can believe everything I have said up to this point is real, but if you do not receive God's gift of salvation, it will remain unopened. Imagine you are told that you have a wealthy relative who has left you a large inheritance. All you have to do is sign a paper saying you accept and the inheritance is yours. Now, imagine not signing. You can talk about how wonderful this relative is and how much they love you. You can read the paper over and over again to your heart's content. But if you do not sign, you cannot claim the inheritance. So it is with God. I urge you today to consider what I have shared with you. Your eternal future depends on it. Pick up a Bible and follow along with the video, and you can see that what I've said is true. If you choose not to believe, I hope and pray that you will reconsider. If you do believe what I have told you, then I urge you to pray and ask God to help guide you. Read the Bible. It is God's word. It is also important, if you have done this, that you find a good Bible-believing church. I intend to show you how to do that in another video on this channel. In addition, I will link to several excellent resources below this video, which will help steer you in the right direction. Thank you for watching. Thank you.